uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome Lara again. She's no stranger, of course, to this institute. She's been here many times, and every time she has brought a great enrichment to us of her extraordinary knowledge of France at this stage. She has knowledge of many places, but of France in particular, and she has worked in France for over 20 years, I think, reporting on France. And she is, of course, a Chevalier de la Légion d'honneur, uh, in recognition of that fact. Uh, about the subject, uh, we have looked on, I think, most of us, at a country that we love and respect and uh, have seen these attacks on its social fabric, on its democracy uh, and on its economy and the economic factors are very big here. At a time when President Macron was trying to get the finances in order and deficit and so on. And we have wondered why. Uh, why uh, are things so bad for working people in France that this is what they have to do? Uh, following a hike in petrol prices, which we have all suffered from temporarily, glad to say, and, and then uh, a tax on a carbon tax, which maybe we should have a bit more of. Uh, and we have watched the social fabric of France really been challenged as never before, certainly not since 1968, but in a, this was more very different to 1968. This was a different type of people and so on and so forth. And we have watched uh, the president, Macron, been under siege like I don't remember any other president in France and I have, I'm sorry to say, have known most of them uh, from a distance since Charles de Gaulle. Uh, I was a student in France at that time. And uh, it's, uh, this is a man whom a lot of us, and indeed We've been meeting, a few of us have been meeting in a group called the French Reflection Group, uh, uh, talking about Macron, about uh, the great things he could, he could bring about for Europe. Uh, his speech at the Sorbonne resonates with vision, uh, with courage and, and insights, and of course his incredible intelligence. But Macron is the one who has been personally attacked and personally weakened and personally wounded <coughs> in all of this. And even I have watched him in France, watched him in October uh, make a speech. Uh, this was after a terrible summer. Uh, don't forget that he has had several crises. Minister for the Environment, a uh, very top figure in France, resigning. Uh, then the old, uh, an old socialist recruit, uh, Colomb, resigning, and then the affair Benalla, which was extremely bizarre, one has to say. So he was uh, weakened by all of that, but seemed to have recovered. And then, uh, then there was the meeting in Paris, which I thought would be terrific. The First World War centenary, where again he met Macron, and we could see the. The, the German uh, Franco Alliance coming together, uh, but I'm afraid uh, all of this recent thing has, has wounded him deeply. So, uh, Lara will be uh, fascinating on this, and we'll leave uh, enough time for questions and answers because I have so many questions <laughs> that. Uh, 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 and, and, uh, uh, but I won't hold the, the, the mic. So, Lara, it's great to see you again and you. Uh, looking so well. And thank you very much for coming. A very short notice, by the way. Uh, thank you, Joe. 
and thank all of you for coming out on a Monday morning when the weather is fine and one would rather be walking around Dublin or something probably. But um, thank you, Joe. I basically Joe said more or less what I had. <laughs> God. <laughs> so. Uh, I've got a sort of draft here, so I'm going to kind of go through it for about 15, 20 minutes and then open the floor up to questions. Um, yes, my, my feeling, really very powerful feeling in recent weeks has been one of immense sadness uh, because I love France, like Joe, and probably all of you. Um, and I kept thinking back to that, that incredible high of the election night and uh, Macron walking across the courtyard of the Louvre to the sound of Beethoven's Ode to Joy. Um, and certainly at the time, everyone pointed out this is the European hymn, and there were European flags everywhere, and there have been European flags at his rallies and so on. And you know, joy, that was, it was really about joy. And uh, you probably remember as well on his inauguration day, the way he, he rode up the Champs Elysees in the back of a command car. And um, François Hollande had this unfortunate habit of seeming to attract rain clouds and everywhere he went it just rained and rained and rained and rained. And it was a rainy day um, for the, the inauguration and the moment that Macron walked out of the Élysée Palace and headed for the Champs Élysées, the clouds parted and the sun came out. <laughs> and uh, the Irish Times actually is one of the, the best titles they ever, ever put on one of my reports. Uh, front page headline was with a photograph of Macron standing proudly was by Jupiter the sun always shines on Macron <laughs> so I, I thought it was really lovely and then it, it was sort of like a, a flash forward 19 months um, to to November December and you know Macron he has a sort of hunted look in his eyes that look in his eyes has, has actually changed um, when he went to survey the damage, when he came back from the, the um, G, is it G7 or G20, I can't remember. G20. G20 in Argentina. Um, he was booed and hissed by Gilets Jaunes, by, by the crowd. And then again, there was a very dramatic incident where he went to a prefecture in the Loire that had been burned down with the, the prefect and his family still in the building. The, the Gilets Jaunes set fire to it. And he, I know, because I'm on the board of the Presidential Press Association, the journalists were furious because he snuck out of the Elysee without notifying anyone. They went without a press pool or anything. And he tried to reach out to people as he came out of the prefecture after a meeting there. He rolled down the window of the car, and again, he was hissed and booed. Um, so there is this, this incredible hatred, and it's very, very personal. A lot of the graffiti is... Um, Obscene words, Macron, Macron, Louis XVI, uh, Macron démission, that is their one slogan over and over again, Macron resign. Um, so Macron, I, I think one doesn't know how he's feeling personally, he hasn't told me, um, but he gave the impression of just hunkering down in the Elysée Palace, of just, just going, into high, going to ground, and one didn't hear anything from him for about 10 days until that night of December 10th when he made his speech. Um, and I, to me, the, the one line that, that really struck me in that speech um, was it was like a confession or an admission. He, he talked about the distress of the most disadvantaged French people and he said, open quote, it doesn't date from yesterday, but we got used to it in a cowardly manner and at the end of the day, things went on as if they, that is to say the, the poor, the disadvantaged, as if they were erased and forgotten. So he's, he's admitting that he didn't see them. Uh, and I, I thought that this oubli uh, was really tragic because in his book, um, very accurately, presciently named Autobiographical Manifesto, Révolution, which he published in 2016, he wrote about peripheral France. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the term peripheral France, la France périphérique, which was coined by Christophe Guilly, uh, a geographer. And it's all about people who live not even in the banlieue, but beyond the banlieue, in, in sort of rural France, or they call them urbain, who uh, rely excessively on their cars because they have to commute. Um, because there are no more post offices or schools or um, dispensaries or whatever they need near their home, so they have to have cars. 
And he wrote about the lack of, of basic infrastructure in rural France. He talked also, the other big factor in this revolt has been uh, what Macron called the visceral attachment to equality. Uh, Egalité is not one of the three basic words for nothing. I mean, it, it is really, really strong feeling. And whereas I think in, in English-speaking countries, uh, people who succeed are seen more as sort of models and people, you know, we want to emulate them. We all want to get rich and famous and, and whatever. In France, there's just incredible resentment uh, towards people who do get rich. Um, anyways, he talked about this attachment to equality. He said that digital technology, and I, I quote him, cruelly reveals social injustice, the differences in standards of living. It shows the poorest how the rich live, which can feed frustration or even revolt. So he wrote this two years before it happened, and, and I think that's exactly what happened because France invented luxury, and especially when you go to Paris, you know it's just so in your face. Um, and, and these people who cannot afford uh, designer clothes or foie gras or whatever, uh, they see this constantly and they see it a lot on television. Um, so that, that was also a big factor. And um, so two years before this happened, Macron diagnosed the problem. And yet his administration seems to have had a fixation about the automobile, about cars. Uh, they required not one MOT test for older cars, but two MOT tests. And so it means you had to pay for them twice. Um, uh, Edouard Philippe, the prime minister, lowered the speed limit from 90 to 80 kilometers an hour on country roads, saying that it would reduce uh, road fatalities and so on. That infuriated these people because, you know, time is precious, whatever. Uh, and they started sabotaging the radars. Um, because there were also the government also stepped up the number of traffic tickets. Half of the traffic radars in France are now um, dysfunctional, are not are not working. It's just a pretty successful campaign of sabotaging traffic radars. And then uh, the carbon tax, which Joe mentioned, three cents on petrol per liter, six cents on diesel, and that was sort of the last straw. Uh, and I was reminded many times by people I interviewed in recent weeks that um, tax was basically was the root cause of the 1789 re revolution. Uh, there are so many similarities. I mean, you may have seen uh, two days ago, uh, a lot of the women demonstrators were dressing up as Marianne, the symbol of the French Revolution. Uh, the mayors of small towns now have set up a nationwide practice of cahiers de doléances. These are the, the registries of complaints where people go into the mairie and write what, the, what they're angry about. And so these are being gathered up just as it happened in 1789. Um, another sort of little sign of this is that a lot of the demonstrators wear these Phrygian bonnets, you know, the, the caps like they did in 1789. Uh, and of course, Macron being compared to Louis XVI all the time. Uh, and I couldn't help remembering the first time I met Macron was in 2013, he was a, an advisor to François Hollande then, and the Presidential Press Association in, in, invited him to lunch, and I'd never heard of the guy before, and I, well, frankly, I wasn't that impressed. I just thought, you know, another bright young man, overeducated, you know, this sort of thing. But he said that the one quote that I never forgot, and I, I went back to my notebook when he was elected and found it, he said, the French elect a president to be a monarch and then they want to cut his head off. <laughs> and I can't think of a, of a better summary of what has happened in, in the last month. Um, now, the, the, the whole president of the rich uh, moniker, I mean, this is something that has really hurt him, and it's something we, one has heard since the first summer after his election. It basically goes back to three acronyms. APL, the APL, which is the basic housing allowance, <coughs> which Macron increased, by, or was not de he decreased it. He took five euro a month out of everybody's housing allowance. That, that was in the very early stages of his presidency, and that raised a huge um, protest. The CSG, which is the social security tax, he raised the CSG for old age pensioners. 
and um, the argument I thought had a lot of you know made sense. I got this from his economic advisors. He I don't think he ever formulated quite this um, this clearly, but. Our generation, and my anyone in their sort of 60s, 70s, the baby boom generation, was the luckiest generation of all time. We had free education, free medical care, um, full employment for a long time, job security, and this <coughs> people in their 60s, 70s, 80s are sitting on massive savings. Most of them own their own homes, and, and they have all this money in the bank. And so Macron's feeling was, and sometimes this has felt like a generational conflict as well between um, you know, his generation and, and ours. Um, he said they should pay. They, there must be solidarity between generations because young people now don't have all these things that we had. So that was the rationale behind it, but it went down like a lead balloon. And I know a lot of people, um, pensioners, who voted for Macron. He was very popular among uh, senior citizens who now really dislike him because their, their CSJ, their, their social security tax went up. And then of course the final one, which um, the left calls his original sin, was the ESF, which is the wealth tax. Um, you're probably all familiar with it. The old ESF was on, was on capital and property. And he basically just did away with the capital part. There's a flat tax now on if you have money on the, the bourse, uh, you just pay a, a flat tax. A, a I think it's 30%, but it's still a lot less. It was confiscatory before. And he did that in the first months of his presidency. And I have heard that everywhere I have gone. I heard it in Amiens, his hometown. It's the ESF, the ESF, the ESF. And, and the Gilets jaunes want that tax reinstated. And Macron, of course, in his speech on um, December 10th, his televised address, said, no, I'm not going to reinstate the, the ISF because... Um, it's a disincentive to investment in France. We've had it for 40 years, and money keeps leaving the country, and people are not going to invest in France when you, when you take all their money away from them, all their profits away from them. So um, those are also, basically I'm trying, going through the reasons why this happened, and I'll, and I'll talk afterwards about how badly I think he is damaged. Um, The demonstration on Saturday makes me think that it's probably over. Um, I was listening to French radio this morning, and the, um, Eric Ciotti, who is one of the leading members of Les Républicains, the Conservative Party, said, no, it doesn't mean it's over at all. It could start up again any moment, probably after Christmas. He thinks it's going. I don't think so. I think that once you, you've lost, they're down to 66,000 demonstrators for the whole country. And they had almost 300,000 the first, the first week. And it's less than half what it was the previous week. Um, one can ask, what are the factors that, that mean it's subsided? I think uh, there are probably three main factors. That Macron actually gave them an awful lot on December 10th. Um, he, first of all, first before that, even several days before that, he rescinded the, um, the rise in fuel cost in petrol and diesel. That was, that was the initial main demand. He's given a 100, per, 100 euro per month rise in minimum wage, which is going up from, I can't remember the exact figure, it's about 1,400 euro a month to about 1,500 euro a month, uh, which is a 6% um, rise in minimum wage. He's also made over time, and this was a measure that Nicolas Sarkozy had done, which was very popular, and, and um, I think Hollande uh, reversed it, but... Um, overtime hours now will not be taxed, uh, nor there will be social charges on overtime. He's asked big co companies to give year-end bonuses, which will also be tax-free. Uh, he has brought forward uh, the end of the tax d'habitation, this habitation tax for anyone who, who has a dwelling rented or owned on January 1st of every year. That is going to end completely. Um, I, am I forgetting? I think that's about it. But that's, that, this represents 10 billion euro uh, in spending, which, which is huge, and which will, of course, put France over the 3% budget deficit ceiling, uh, which we'll, we'll come back to. 
Uh, so he gave them a, a, an awful lot. Um, I think also the terrorist attack in Strasbourg last week um, probably dampened the Gilets Jaunes spirits uh, that for, for two reasons. One, the government called on them to stop demonstrating out of solidarity with the country. It's like, why would you weaken your country when it's under attack from Islamists? And also, I think there's a fear of being in a demonstration, being in a crowd, and having a suicide bomber or you know, murder with an assault weapon or whatever. Uh, there's a fear of actually being caught in an attack. So that, that's a, a, a two-edged uh, disincentive. And also, the weather's got bad, and Christmas is coming. And I think all of those factors played a role. I mean, when after Macron's speech, there were sort of two schools of thought. One is, we, we've created this huge ruckus, and it's worked. We've, got, we've done very well, let's stop. And the other argument is, we've created havoc, and it's working, let's keep going. Uh, but it did divide the movement. And you had people like Jackie Moreau, who was the, one of the original Gilets Jaunes. Um, she's a, a beautician and what do you call it, a medium, uh, and uh, who had done a, a video that went viral against Macron, very, very vulgar, actually, if I say so, you know, and she's kind of saying, ah, you know, and it's just, just gripe, I mean, and like a six or seven minute gripe, but 600,000 people watched this video, and so she's become a sort of, you know, leading figure, I and mean, the social media effect is, is just incredible. I was at a lunch with Sylvain Faure, who is... Um, head of communications for Macron, and at the very early stages of, of revolt, and he said, this Jacqueline Moreau who pulls spirits out of her fingertips. Uh, and I think I wrote this in the Irish Times, forgive me for quoting myself, but I, I said, you know, it was like sitting next to the, the powdered marquee, and, and, he, and she was the, you know, the, the Jacobin with the, the Phrygian bonnet. I mean, it, you really felt that historical uh, that atavism, you know, coming, coming back. Um, going back to the, the causes of the revolt, um, yeah, I'm trying to read my own notes here. Oh, uh, one thing that's pointed out often is that, that Macron is a victim of a movement that is actually quite similar to what he did. Uh, the, it's a sort of unidentified political object. Um, nobody's ever seen a movement like this in France before, neither left nor right, totally disruptive, <coughs> wanting to overturn the established order. And so in, in a sense, the Gilets jaunes were just repeating what he did with En Marche um, a couple of years ago. Um, I think the, the, this fall from grace probably really, uh, the thing that sort of tripped it off was Alessandro Benalla, the, the bodyguard who, who Joe mentioned. Um, it's interesting that he's actually been placed under investigation over the weekend for a second incident which happened on the same day on May 1st uh, where he beat up, um, we didn't know about this before, in the Jardin des Plantes, uh, there was a very, what they call an, an arrestation musclé, I guess, where they, they kind of grabbed some guys and hit them and, and he uh, is accused of impersonating a, a policeman uh, in that instance as well, as well as the two who we all saw the video of. Um, but Macron really failed to grasp how bad that looked. And the ADZ was completely silent for five days after the story broke on, on July 17th. And I think that, that was a, a huge mistake. And it also, there was nothing else going on. So with the 24-hour news cycle, it was just over and over and over, constantly on the radio, <coughs> on the television, and so on. Um, as Joe said, again, the resignations of Nicolas Hulot at the end of August and um, Gérard Collomb at the beginning of October were extremely damaging. Um, Collomb, in particular, had given several press interviews where he said, uh, Macron doesn't listen to anyone anymore, um, uh, he's arrogant, um, this sort of thing. When you have one of your first supporters saying these sorts of things, and then both of them actually resigned without forewarning. They didn't, usually when you resign from a high government position, and th these, these two men were, I think, third and fourth ranking in, in the, in the cap, no, second and third, anyway, they were top ranking ministers. Um, they showed total disrespect for Macron, 
by resigning by Hulot on the radio and Colomb uh, in an interview with Le Figaro and not even warning him in advance that they were leaving his, his government. Um, and as I've said, the social media, the 24-hour news cycle, uh, also magnifies everything. Um, Macron has a favorite phrase. He talks about um, les premiers décordés, which is, I've, I've looked for a good translation in English. I think it's a lead climber when you have a rope and climbers on a rope. And he always talks about how the, the lead climbers are, must not be dragged down, how France doesn't appreciate them enough, doesn't help them. And he praises these people and he says that they're really necessary. This has been seen from the beginning as a justification of privilege. Uh, so he, and every time he tries to explain it, it just gets worse. And people just go, you know, they, they've got this sort of tunnel vision that he's, he, he loves the rich and the privileged. Um, there, there's also, uh, for example, he talks about France as a startup nation. And this somehow grates on a lot of his opponents as well. They don't like English language terms, for one thing. Um, so that, that's hurt him. Um, and then there have been the, the, the gaffes. Or the, um, they're not that many, maybe six or eight. And actually, in almost every instance, what he said, I believe, was true. Uh, but again, la petite phrase becomes a, a huge issue. There was, um, and this is just the last six months, I and mean, there were more before that. But remember, he said that France, this was in, actually in a meeting at the Elysee, and the video was uh, put on social media by his own staff. He said, France spends, I quote, a crazy amount of dough and people are still poor. He was talking about the social spending, which is the highest in the OECD, which is the highest, um, yes, it is the highest in the EU. 56% uh, of French GDP is in the public sector. About a third of it goes for social programs and social welfare. welfare. And people are still poor because they wouldn't have done this revolt if, if, if they weren't. Um, so he was absolutely right, but that caused a scandal because he used the word pognon d'eau, uh, which was seen as somehow rude or something. Um, then there, there was the incident where the young man addressed him when he was out on the, on the Hastings and said, um, called him tu, the familiar form, and he called him Manu, uh, for, which is short for Emmanuel, of course. And Macron lectured him and he said, you call me Mr. President or Sir. Uh, and this again, you know, he was right, it was rude and so on and so forth, but I, I would have liked to have seen him handle it with a sense of humor or lightness of touch. Um, de Gaulle was very good at that. You might remember once de Gaulle was uh, at a rally and someone shouted, Morocco! And de Gaulle said, Vast programme. <laughs> you know, and I think if, if Macron could master that sort of, of uh, repost, it would, it would really help him. But um, another, and this one I, I thought was totally unfair. He was in, um, I believe he was in Copenhagen um, on a state visit. And he said that the French were Gauls, the, the Gallois, I guess I think you could translate that as Gauls, 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 uh, resistant to change, refactor au, au, au changement, au progrès, whatever. And that caused a, a storm. You know, and you, you would think that people who dislike Donald Trump and who see all the rude things that he says every single day, you know, would be a little bit less judgmental about this sort of thing. Um, and then there are other, there's just sort of image problems. You may remember he was in the West Indies a year after the, that terrible storm that, that killed, I don't know, a couple dozen people and so on. And he posed, um, well, actually, he wasn't really posing. But somebody photographed it with an iPhone. There were two young men, one naked from the waist up uh, and the other one, and he was giving a finger to the camera, and the other one with a big gold chain and a white shirt had just got out of prison. And Macron sort of lectured him about, now you behave yourself and, you know, you look after your mother and this sort of thing. But that photograph of Macron with his with these two West Indian chaps, you know, um, and the background, and one of them with shirtless, and everything, that really upset a lot of people. Uh, it's upset Marine Le Pen, who tweeted about it, and it, it upset a lot of elderly people who tend to be more conservative and who are already angry about the CSG, as I mentioned. Um, and there was also another one which, which was true, but again, very unfortunate. It was on uh, Heritage Day, Le, Le Jour du Patrimoine, 
uh, when Macron and, and Brigitte let people come and visit the Elysee Palace, and he actually went out to talk to them. And he's always criticized for being distant and cold and this sort of thing. And he, he made the effort and the gesture of going and talking to the people who'd come to the Elysee Palace. And there was a 25-year-old man who said, I trained as a horticulturist, and I can't find any work. And Macron said, well, actually, there's a lot of work in France everywhere I go. Employers complain to me that they can't fill jobs. And there are, of course, plenty of jobs in hotels, restaurants, and construction. But French people don't want to do those jobs. Macron said, unfortunately, I can cross the street and find your job. Je traverse la rue et je vous trouve du, du travail. And that also caused a whole other week of scandal. Uh, so the poor guy, no matter what he says, he's pilloried for it. Um, I think that all of these incidents might have passed, would, might have been forgotten, if the Macron had the economic results. Uh, but growth, economic growth in France remains very slow, unemployment remains very high, it's still over 9%. And uh, taxes keep going up, and public services keep diminishing. So people are very unforgiving. Um, and I think he thinks that his, his policies will give results, but it's been, it's been too slow in coming. So now, because of the riots, he has realized that he has to give tangible improvements fast. <coughs> And the hope is that these, these ten, this 10 billion euro that he's spending will, will do that, that the, the stimulus will, will actually work. Um, I went through the measures a little earlier. Um, I, I think that it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out with the EU, because already the Italian government is saying, ah, well, how come France can uh, violate the, the, the Stability and Growth Pact and we cannot? Uh, and they're actually not even, they're under the 3%. They just have a, a really enormous debt. Um, will the Germans hold it against him that he's no longer showing this financial rigor that he, he promised? Probably. Uh, but I think it will, it will draw France closer to uh, more left-leaning um, people in the European Parliament, uh, parties in, in Europe. Um, Joe also mentioned the, the September 2017 speech at the Sorbonne, and he, was, he, he did promise in that speech that France would show the way by reforming its own economy. He said, we were not credible unless we do this ourselves. And he, indeed, he made two very important reforms in his first year in office. Um, he reformed the labor code, and he also reformed the SNCF, the railway company. And these are things that many of his predecessors had wanted or tried to do and, and just gave up and, and weren't able to do it. And Macron did it uh, with some protests, but nothing on the scale of the Gilets Jaunes. Um, so now the question is, can he continue reforming? And there are two very important reforms coming up. Um, the unemployment system, uh, which France has the most generous benefits of, of any country. I mean, I have a friend my own age who is earning more on unemployment than I am earning working for the Irish Times, and she's actually earning more than she did when she was employed. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, anyway, so, so he's trying to, he wants to reform the unemployment system and also the pension system, because there are 42 different pension regimes in France, and he wants, them, he wants that to be streamlined, he wants one pension system for everybody. Can he do this? Um, I don't know, I think that for at least another six months or so, he will not dare to take any measures or even propose anything that will cause any economic pain because the last thing he wants is for people to go back into, into the street. Uh, his ability to lead the, the Make Our Planet Great Again crusade is also very impaired um, because he had a carbon tax and he cancelled it. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I don't know wh wh where that's going to go. Um, I heard Brune Poisson, who's the deputy minister for, well, she's for ecology uh, on the radio yesterday or today, and she was vaunting all the measures that they're taking and saying that they're still leading the, the, the fight against climate change and so on. So, so maybe they can. Um, next uh, May's EU elections are, are the first big test of all this. Uh, Macron, of course, had portrayed it as a contest between progressives and nationalists. 
um, he being progressive and people like Marine Le Pen and Viktor Orban and Matteo Salvini being the nationalists. Uh, unfortunately for Macron, the polls all show that Le Pen's party, which is now called the Rassemblement National, the, the RN, will come in first. Uh, they, they won the last European elections, they got 25% of the vote then. Um, and that will be a blow to Macron if that happens. Um, it's interesting that the, the Gilets Jaunes, although they are not a political party and they don't really have any uh, clearly identified leaders, polls show that they would get 12% in EU elections if they happened now. Uh, and between Marine Le Pen and Nicolas Dupont-Aignan, who was her running mate in the presidential election, and the Gilets Jaunes, they'd have almost 50% of the vote, uh, which, is, which is frightening. Um, so uh, another interesting aspect of all this is that the, the foreign leaders who Macron has criticized, um, to my mind with good reason, they have reveled in, in this whole thing. And uh, Donald Trump, for example, after the, uh, let me see, it must have been the December 8th riots, um, said that it proved that the Paris Climate Accord was not working, the fact that people had rioted over a carbon tax and that they, they didn't want it and so on. Uh, Matteo Salvini uh, said, Ma Ma Macron is no longer a problem for me or for Europe, he's a problem for the French. The Iranian foreign ministry uh, warned the French government to, quote, stop violence against its own people. Uh, Vladimir Putin and Recep Tayyip Erdogan also made very similar statements. Um, Erdogan warned of a wave of terrorist attacks across France, and this was before the, the Strasbourg attack. Um, one thing I was very worried about when the riots were going on was that there could be a crisis on several fronts at the same time. Because you had a, a popular revolt, I thought, please don't let there be any terrorist attacks, we had that. Um, not sure if it helped end the riots or, or not, but that can happen again, it can happen today, tomorrow, it can happen anytime. And the third thing is the banlieue. Um, the, the immigrant suburbs have actually been very, very quiet. Now, people I, I know who have witnessed these horrible, you know, vandalism, acts of vandalism claim that basically what happens is you have three waves. You have first the ideologues who come in and talk about social justice and equality and so on. Um, then you have the sort of anarchists, the, the casseurs, who come in and start breaking windows and, and you know, destroying things. And then you have the, 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 the looters. And the, I have been told repeatedly, that, in, and sometimes minutes after it happened, that the looters are coming from the banlieue. So, so there's like three, three groups that have their role. But the banlieue has been very quiet, and they have not joined forces with the Gilets Jaunes. But those are, those are the three potential um, fronts that, that Macron is facing. Um, the Macron said, and, and I think he's right, that this is a historic turning point in, in, in his, certainly in his administration in, in French history as well. And he's, he promised, he said, open quote, we will not resume the normal course of our lives as we have done too often in the past in similar crises without changing anything, um, without anything having been truly understood or truly changed. And, and I think he meant it. I think it, it took uh, three or four weeks to really sink in the, the seriousness of this crisis and the depth of dissatisfaction among people. Uh, he said that the anger of the yellow vest could prove salutary. And, and I think he's right about that as well. It's unfortunate that Seven people have been killed, always in accidents, <coughs> at, at barricades, basically. Uh, it's, it's very unfortunate that people died, that hundreds of millions of, of euro in economic damage has been done. Um, but it seems that this is the only way for change to happen in France, is these very dramatic, violent revolts. And Macron has realized that his... Well, actually, it was, it was uh, Jean-Yves Le Drian, the foreign minister, who, um, who said that Macron had put too much emphasis on competitiveness and not enough on fairness. And his, his administration has now definitely turned leftward. There will be much more social policy, uh, much more concern about equality and, and uh, standard of living uh, of people, and, and less concern about those rich investors and bringing them back from Brussels and London. Um, 
if Macron comes out of this crisis having learned how to, how to govern better, and governing France is never an easy task, um, he may actually be, be more credible. Uh, he may rebound. I, I think there's probably no uh, statesman in the world who hasn't faced deep crises. Um, but, and I, I talked to Jean-Louis Janinet, who's a friend and a prominent historian in France, and he wrote a book about Macron and his historic context. Um, he, he said, pointed out that the revolution, if you look back on the French revolutions, and these aren't all of them, but there's 1789, 1848, 1871, 1968, in all of those instances, they were, they were followed by a right-wing backlash. Um, and the thing that the Yellow Vest revolt has shown is that you could have a coalition of the dissatisfied ranging from extreme left to extreme right, this sort of mixed bag, quite similar to, to the Cinque Stelle in Italy, um, that they could actually, something like that, could change totally the political situation, could, could actually even come to power. Um, and if, if Macron fails, and we really are at that point where we don't know, um, I think that the extremists will, will definitely be the beneficiaries. Questions?